This morning we'll talk about observing I. We've got to know every I in us if we wish to grow further. Oh, don't add more on to me. Stop it. <laughs> Leave me alone. Why do you pick on me like this? Like I'm just telling you that we need to be more aware. That's all. Truly, really all I'm saying is we need to be more conscious than we now are. If we want to continue to grow, if we want to grow further, we need to be more conscious. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because growth is about consciousness. If you're going to grow, if you're going to progress, if you're going to move along this path, you must become more conscious of what you are, who you are, what you're doing, where you are. Makes sense? So we need to become more conscious of every eye in us. We've got to know them all. As we are, we're conscious generally of one eye at a time. And we take that eye as ourselves. This is how we live our lives. I think this, I feel that, I want this, I know that. That I, whatever I that is, we take as ourselves. The attraction in this state of mind is that we see no contradictions in ourselves and we live in a very small place at any particular moment. And this is a huge asset when you think about it because a very small place is much easier to control. There's much less fear in a small place. This is why people love prison so much. Oh, just give me a little eight by 10 cell. Are they that big? They're not even that big. Give me a little cell and three squares a day and a cot and a toilet and a sink and a mirror and, you know, somebody who I can talk to in the cell next to me, but I don't actually have to see. Wow, that's perfection, isn't it? And it is perfection for some people. And so they are career criminals. They go to jail and they stay there. And then one day they're released and they go out into the world and they go, ah! I can't take it. And they go do something to get back to jail as fast as possible. They, they, they go everywhere and look for a get back to jail free card. And so they go steal Monopoly game and they get back to jail free and they go back to jail and live happily ever after because it's what they are comfortable with. It's what they're used to. And we are just like that. Only our prison is not an institution made by the state or the federal government, it's an institution that we make ourselves and that we acquire from other people. From a, we, we take bits and pieces of other people's prisons and we finally build our own. As work memory increases through self-observation, we begin to distrust the I that we happen to be in at the moment. We don't believe what it's saying. We don't believe so much what it's thinking. We don't believe so much what it's feeling in that moment. You notice this? about yourself, you'll have an eye come up and you just kind of distrust it. Well, I know this eye. This, I've been through, I've been here before. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it gets upset at something. Uh, Diana had, uh, she, I was listening to her this morning tell a story about going to the bank and there were some people picketing outside the bank. They didn't want anybody to go to the bank. They wanted everybody to believe about the bank what they believed about the bank. And so they were picketing and yelling and harassing people as they went into the bank. And if you were going to cross the picket line and go into the bank, they were going to abuse you, verbally abuse you. For that. Diana had an eye that came up and decided to be upset by the fact that these people were trying to take away her right to go into the bank, trying to stop her to go into the bank. Of course, they weren't trying to stop her from going into the bank. They were trying to persuade her not to go into the bank. To stop her from not going to the bank is very easy. She only weighs 85 pounds. You just pick her up by the head and put her somewhere else, you know. Here, go somewhere else. She's just a little twig of a person. So, you know, just it wouldn't take much to stop anyone from going into the bank if that's what you want. But no, it's not that. It's to persuade you to believe what I believe. To persuade you to see that what I see is the truth. That's what they were doing. And so Diana was offended. Diana had an eye that decided to be offended by this and to get angry about this, which I think is rather comical because now she's beginning to see that this I spends a lot of time in charge. She's angry a lot because people aren't doing what she thinks they should do, what this I thinks they should do. So she's beginning to distrust this I. She's beginning to hear what it's saying and see what it's doing and see what it's feeling and saying, you know, I'm not so sure this I is really me. And if it is, I don't think I want to be this I. This is progress in the work. When you see that, and you say, I don't, that's not I, I don't want to be like that. If that's me, I want to be somebody else. Good. That's good. That's a good place to be. 
That's an excellent place to be. When you start to see that about yourself, instead of getting depressed, you people who get depressed by this, I think, hello, wake up. This is progress. You should be excited by this. Look at what a creep I am. I don't want to be like that. Good. I don't want you to be like that either. What do you think we've been trying to tell you all these years? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Stop being like that, you jerk. You're not like that, really. And the truth is, you're not really like that. It's just some I that you've identified with that you call yourself. And as you start to pull away from it, as you start to find some separation by looking at it, by observing what it thinks, what it says, what it does, by looking at it, you separate from it. You can't be what you're observing. And as you're observing it dispassionately, uncritically, you then start to create a gulf between you and it. And as you create this gulf, it has less and less power over you until you finally can observe it as if it really were an interesting stranger. And it doesn't matter what it's doing. See, you, I've heard people say this just this morning. I've heard people say, well, when I see it, I, somehow I just I identify with it. And Yes, 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 we all identify. Our job is to identify less. That's all. That's all. No, I never said don't identify ever with anything. What I am saying is, look, we're identified. Don't identify ever with anything. There, now I've said it. You happy? <laughs> now you can't do that, but it's a goal. And someday you will be able to not identify with anything. Someday that will happen. Someday you will be able to not identify with anything. Until then, identify less. Okay, that's all. Lighten up. Lighten up. Have a little fun. Enjoy your life. This is a short life. It doesn't last long. It's like, pew, here today, gone tomorrow. So enjoy it. Enjoy this work. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. This work is so exciting. This work is, this work is joy. If you're not, if you're not finding joy in this work, something's wrong. Do you understand what if something is wrong? Do I look like a, like an unhappy person? This work makes me happy because it's freeing me from all of the things that make me unhappy, which is me. <laughs> all of the things that make me unhappy is me. And to be free from me, who could not be happy? That's like being filled with helium, you know, and just rising above yourself. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful experience. We must be far more conscious of the rotation of eyes in us, remembering what one another I said, or we have no distinct being. See, if we don't become aware of this rotation of eyes, and there's a, it's a really a very small rotation. Now, okay, there are hundreds of thousands of eyes in us. But when you think about it, you've just got a, a handful that you actually play the game with. It's like poker. You got five cards. Well, you got like five eyes. Actually, you got about five personalities that you play the game with the game of life. And each one of those personalities is made up of a bunch of eyes. But basically, you've got about five personalities, and you play the game with those personalities. And most people don't even use all five. You know, there are a couple that you'll throw away. If you get three of a kind, you're pretty happy with that. <laughs> you know, a full house is a big deal with a hand, you know, a straight or something like that. I don't know that much about poker, but I know that there are, you know, you can get a pair, you can get three of a kind, you can get four of a kind, but you can't get five of a kind, I guess. So, uh, but you can get a full house or a straight or things like that. And so, and each of them are, are more important in the game in ascending order as, as they're more difficult to get. I guess they're more important and you can win more. And the way it is with, with us is that we've got a few, uh, a few personalities that we use mainly, that we rely on mainly. So it shouldn't be too difficult to see which personality is running you at the moment. Oh yes, I know this one. This is the whimpering, whining one. Oh, yes, I know this one. This was the angry tyrant that's going to bash people's heads until it gets its way. Oh, I know this one. This is the powder. You know, it's going to pout and whine and whimper and do all that for, for yeah, the self-pity. And you, and you know that it's got a group. It's got its own little family of eyes, you know. Oh, it's the whining family here. Oh, I don't know why he did that. You know, or it's the angry family. Who does he think he is? Or it's the superior family. Well, I don't do that. 
you know, whatever. It's, and they're little families of eyes that make up these personalities. And we need to see this. And we need to see this rotation. We need to become aware of this. Our being is constantly shifting. Why is it that we can't be what we want to be? Well, because we're being whatever, whatever life makes us be. Somebody pulls out in front of you. Somebody doesn't let you out in traffic. And what are you being? You be <laughs> okay. Well, some of you know some some of you are being like, oh, what's the world coming to? I remember when people used to be nice and let other people out, and other people just well, I'll show you, and they just pull out with their blare in the horn, flashing the lights. They pull out and flip them off and yell out the window, yeah, I'll take that. <coughs> you know, so so there are just different ways to handle the same situation. But whatever it is you're being, it's not you being it. It's the situation making you be that. Because you've got all these shifting eyes that you can't identify, you can't stop identification with. Because you're not seeing them, you're not observing them. So the trick in this work is to simply observe them. Oh, look at this. Here comes the mad, insane driver I. Wants to get even, wants to get there. It's in a big rush, doesn't care about traffic rules, doesn't care about other people because nobody cares about it. So it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and if you don't look out for yourself, nobody else will look out for you, and blah, 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 blah. You know the speeches? Those are the eyes you need to be, look, those are the eyes you need to be aware of. That's all. Just remain aware. Look at them. Uncritically, dispassionately. Yep, there they are. I know those eyes. They've been around my whole life. The good news is, there's an eye that can stand above ordinary eyes. The bad news is we have to learn to use it, which takes right effort. Oh, man, more right effort. I hate it when he says that. Well, sorry. That's the way it is. If you're going to make effort, make it right effort, the kind of effort that will produce results. Why make the same kind of effort we've always made? Spinning our wheels. You know, run through a tank of gas, spinning our wheels, digging ourselves deeper. Well, we know how to do that. Burning the tires off the rims. You know, we know how to do that. Let's try and do something where we actually get somewhere. Where the effort we make is the, actually the right kind of effort that actually moves us toward our goal. Wow, what a concept. Observing eye can have a memory of its own because it stands outside the machinery of ordinary eyes and views them in a detached way. And while it's doing that, it is building work memory. Work memory. Work memory. Work memory is that memory in you when that eye comes up and you say, I remember this eye. You don't say, I feel this. I think this. You say, I remember this eye. So there's some other eye that's looking at that and saying, I remember this eye. I know this guy and I know what he wants to do. He's not a nice fellow. See? And that's really it, isn't it? There are eyes in you that are not nice fellows. And you really need to be separate from those eyes. You need to back away from those eyes. That eye, That's not me. That's not I. It likes to think it's I, but it's not I. I even like to think it's I sometimes. You know, there are some eyes that we just love. We love their negative. We love what they give us. They, the power they give us. The sense of freedom they give us. The sense of invulnerability they give us. Angry eyes are like that. We love those angry eyes because they give us a sense of power and invulnerability. It's all lie, but you, know, you find that out later on. Well, you find it out when you find it out. Each eye, mechanically having charge for the moment, has its own memory. But observing eye has a different quality of memory. Now, you know that each eye has a memory. Each eye knows how to do what it does. Mm -hmm. And it remembers how to deal with certain people and it remembers how to deal with certain situations. It has its own memory, but it's not a very good memory. The quality of its memory is just not the kind of quality you really want in your life. Not if you want to do this work, not if you want to move along this path, not if you want to progress, not if you want to develop and change your level of being and become a different kind of person. If that's what you want, you need a different quality of memory. You need to hang out with a different quality of eyes. This work should make you uneasy about yourself and your contradictions. We've got a dim awareness of what we're like, but we identify with it and judge ourselves according to our upbringing. I think we all know what we're like. Some of us pick at people, but we do it in a, in a kind of a funny way so that it's always, ha, ha, ha. They never really get the jab. I mean, they get the jab, but they can never really pin it on us. You know what I mean? Because we're laughing. <laughs> we make it seem like it's all a joke. We have this 
way out. Well, I was just kidding. Why are you getting upset? I, was, I didn't mean it that way. Lighten up. Why do you take yourself so seriously? They turn it around. We turn it around on the other person. So some of us have that kind of an eye. <laughs> yeah, it's a little digger, a little poker. Yeah, And it's always right. Of course, any eyes that we have are always right. How many eyes do you have that are always wrong? You know what kind of a person you are. You've got this dim awareness of it. But somehow we justify it by our upbringing and we stay that way. And that's unfortunate because that keeps us the same. But this work begins to make you a little uneasy about that. You, you start, you know, you, you know those things. We all have this dim awareness. But this work starts to bring a little more light to that awareness, and you start to feel a little uneasy with yourself. It's like, oh, I'm not sure I like that so much. No, I'm not sure I'm, I may not be as nice as I thought I was. I may not be as good as I thought I was. Now, some of you haven't come to that yet. You still really think you are as good as you always thought you were. Have I got news for you? But of course, you're not listening, so it doesn't matter. There's a voice in you that is louder than mine. Let's put it that way. This work will make you uneasy about your contradictions, if you allow it. Observing eye can observe you uncritically without, identif without identifying. It observes your personality impersonally. And that's not something that we can do with our normal eyes, with ordinary eyes. We can't view our personality impersonally. We, and, and, and look at, just let me give you an example. If I criticize anything about you, you take it personally. You get upset. I say, you know, Tammy, you really need, when you yawn, you really need to hold a bed sheet over your head because, <laughs> you see, <laughs> but we, we take things personally. What did he mean by that? I wonder if he really meant that. Why is he picking on me? Other people yawn. Well, we go through all kinds of insanity, and we go through this insanity because we're identified. Observing eye can observe uncritically without identifying. It observes your personality impersonally. Personality is composed of different eyes turning like a wheel, with one eye uppermost this moment and another eye uppermost the next moment. Observing eye is above the wheel. It's that simple. So it's actually looking down at the wheel. And here are all these eyes turning on this wheel. And this eye is uppermost, and then this eye is uppermost, and then this eye is uppermost. And observing eye is just watching it all. No judgment, just watching it and taking it all in and recording it all recording it all, just exactly as it is, without any filters, without any judgments, without any, <coughs> well, that's not right. It's not looking at it saying it's right or wrong. It's just saying that's what's, a, that's what's happening now. You're getting a flavor for this? Good. That's all I want you to do. Just want you to get a taste of this. Observing eye doesn't take sides with anything. It records what you're doing, saying, whatever it is, at different moments, without saying it's better or worse, it's not shocked by anything. You can train yourself to be like this. You can train observing eye into yourself. Not to be shocked. How do you not be shocked? Look, this is just a machine. This is a machine. What's, what's so shocking about a machine? This is what it does. Wheels turn on. People see cars drive down the street. They aren't shocked by that anymore. But do you know when there were horses pulling buggies, that the first car come down the street, people were shocked. They were shocked by the noise. They were shocked by a, a, a carriage moving without a horse pulling it. They were shocked by that. It was a shocking thing. Now it's common. Now you see a horse pulling a carriage down the street and you're shocked by that. Things have changed. <laughs> observing eye can be like that. It's shocked by nothing. Ospensky said, observing eye must stand outside the personality, this cage of eyes constantly taking charge, calling themselves I. That is you. That is you. What you are is this cage of eyes, this zoological thing, this bunch of eyes in a cage. And the, each one saying, I'm, I, this is, I'm James, I'm this, I'm that, I'm Tammy, I'm Steve, I'm Pat, I'm Rex. And then the next one comes up and says, no, I am. And the next one comes up, I am. And they, they don't even fight over it. They are so sure that they are I that there's nothing even to discuss because they're absolutely certain that when they're in charge, they are I. Our job is to develop an observing eye, which begins to weaken that, the hold that those little eyes have on us. What we usually do is let one eye observe another eye and criticize and find fault with the eye that is observing. This is what a lot of people call self-observation. 
They have one little eye observe another little eye and criticize it. Then they wonder why they're depressed. <laughs> or they wonder why they're angry. Or they wonder why they feel overwhelmed and burdened. Well, that's why. You've got one little eye observing another little eye, and this little mealy mouth is writing a list of everything that's wrong with that other eye. Now, this is what we all start off doing, people. So lighten up. Yeah, you do that. Okay. So what? Let's work our way out of it. <laughs> Don't, they're not throwing the shovel, the last full, shovel full of dirt on your face yet. There's still time. You can still work. You still got some life in you. Not much, I admit, but you still got a little. You could still work. You could still make some effort. You could still do something. Give it a try. Don't give up yet. It's not over yet. The sun keeps coming up in the morning and you keep waking up. And as long as you keep waking up, well, what are you going to do? Let's work. We, I can work. You know, isn't this the great thing? I can work. And this is the great thing no matter what happens. I can work. It's really great when you think about it. And I want you to think about it. So observing eye stands outside all these eyes on a level above personality. Observing eye is the most important thing to establish in ourselves if we want to change. Because there's no change possible without observing eye, without some kind of form of separation from these other eyes that are carrying on all this in this mad way. Observing eye is under the influence of the work itself. At first, our task is to establish an impersonal, uncritical observation of ourselves. So what we work on at first, because we don't have observing eye, what we work on is establishing at first, an eye that can be uncritical, that can observe the other eyes uncritically. And it is guided by the work principles. It is reminded by the work. No, 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 don't get all uppity. Don't think you're superior. Don't think you're better. You're just another eye. Now, don't remember, you're not here to judge. You're not here to criticize. You're not here to find fault with these eyes. You're just here to observe them. So the work reminds us, the work ideas remind that eye what its job is. That eye is a work eye. It wants to work. And so that's where we start in building observing eye. And this is the whole thing about this work. Look, you've got to start where you are. You can't start where somebody else is. You must start where you are. And then you expect to be man number seven in, in, in seven weeks or less. And it's like it doesn't happen that way. It takes a long time, so lighten up. You're here for the duration. Or you're not. If you're not, well, oh well. All this is just useless, unnecessary suffering for you, then. What's uncritical, anyway? Now, we, we, all this uh, observing eye isn't critical, an uncritical observation of ourselves. Well, what is uncritical, anyway? Do, you, do we really know what uncritical is? I'll tell you what uncritical is. It's not good or bad. It's not looking at something like it's good or bad. It doesn't say anything about it. It doesn't have anything to say about it. Well, it is what it is. Oh, well, that's good. Well, that's bad. Well, that's good. Well, that's bad. Well, that's a little bit better. That's all, that's all critical, you see. All of the, all of the shades of goodness and badness, that's all critical. Uncritical is it's not good and it's not bad. It just is what it is. What a concept. Simply see the machine of yourself. Acquired eyes in you are doing, saying, feeling this or that in a particular moment. So at this moment, these acquired eyes are saying this. They're feeling that. They're thinking this. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's just that simple. Don't add anything else to it now. Just observe, only observe, nothing else. Don't judge. Don't criticize. Don't say it's good or bad. Don't say it's pleasant or unpleasant. Just let it be. Eventually, observing eye will include the whole of your life, becoming conscious of all sides of you. This work takes time. You're going to become aware of little parts of you at a time. Be grateful for that, because if you became aware of all of you all at once, you'd go nuts because of the contradictions. But we only become aware of what we can handle, what we can bear at the moment. We can't bear the contradictions. We won't become aware of them. It's just that simple. This work will protect you. It will insulate you from yourself. Certain things in us are incompatible with other things, and we feel conflict and distress. That's the way it is. We all know that about ourselves. We just don't know what those specific things are most of the time. Because if we did, we'd do something about it. But we can't do anything, so we can't really do anything about it. So until we can do something, the work protects us from that. It insulates us from that. So that we don't get any more than we could bear. Because that would send us off the deep end. And we're marginal as it is. You think about it. Look how easily depressed you are. Look how easily discouraged you are. You know, that's marginal. 
<laughs> you think about it, it's like, yo, this is a long road. If you're going to get tired out on the first leg of the journey, how do you expect to make it? A man thinks things are evil due to a narrow outlook. If he becomes broader minded, things change. Nothing is incompatible for observing I because nothing is criticized. We can all look back at the person, at a person that we were when we were Democrats or we were Republicans or we were Greenpeacers or we were this or we were independents or we were whatever. And now we look back at that and go, well, that was silly. Because you know that any kind of narrow-mindedness, any kind of selection of, well, this is the right way, excludes everything else. And that's silliness because nothing is all good and nothing is all bad. Everything is useful in its proper place and at the proper time. And it's a matter of knowing when that is and being able to put things together in the right way, which is understanding connect things up as they should be connected. Once you know that or begin to know that, then you see the silliness in narrow-mindedness. America, love it or leave it. All right. Now, you may have thought that at some point in your life, but hopefully you don't think that now. You may have thought, well, anybody over 30 is a nitwit. They're all, they're half dead anyway. You may have thought that, but of course, anybody who's under 30 probably doesn't have two thoughts to rub together. Oh, that's pretty narrow-minded. Did I say that? <laughs> so you see what I mean? So it's a matter of just it's a matter of just observing that. Yes, there's an eye that thinks that people who are under 30 aren't very bright. Yes, yes, there's an eye that thinks that. Well, that's not that's not I. But you said it. <laughs> no, I didn't say it. It said it. Well, what are you telling me that you're not responsible? Yeah, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm telling you I'm not responsible. I'll be accountable. You can hold me accountable for saying that, but I'm not responsible, no. Because the I that said that left me holding the bag. Because I know better. I look at that and I go, well, that's, that's, not, that's not right. But what I is talking, well, that's what you're here to find out. No, 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 not what I is talking in me, what I is talking in you. You're not here to find out what I is talking in me. You already know all that. Oh, I know him. I know what he said. Oh, he's just like that. That's the way he does it. Oh, well, he always does that. He always says that. He thinks this. He thinks that. No, 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 no. This is all about you. This is what you've always wanted. A whole universe all about you. <laughs> you finally got it. You're the star of the show. It's all about you. So just leave me out of this. Leave everybody else out of it. It's all about you. We must accept the whole of our life, all the side that we currently leave in darkness and that is unconscious, the narrow outlook which we deny having. Uh, it would have been a lot easier for me to deny having a narrow outlook about younger people. Well, they don't have any forebrain yet. That's their problem. Well, they don't have any. Look, I got lots of evidence. The insurance companies agree. The government agrees. The world agrees. Everybody agrees that kids are stupid, but they're not. Well, you're just saying that. Well, yes, actually, I am just saying that. But I'm saying it because it's true. You can't make a blanket statement about all kids. All kids are not stupid. All kids are not smart. All kids are not male. All kids are not female. All kids are not white. All kids are not black. They are what they are. All kids are not 12. All kids are not 18. All kids are not 6. So you can't really make that kind of a statement. Not consciously. We'd like to deny having a narrow outlook about anything. Our little being is always objecting, finding fault at every moment. The cure is to broaden our being. Have you noticed how much you object? Oh, my God. We object to everything. Well, I didn't object to that. Well, wait a few minutes. You will tomorrow. The sooner or later, you will object. Why? Because that's what we do. Why? Because we have a narrow level of being. The cure, broaden your level of being. This is done by becoming more conscious of the eyes in us, able to endure the contradictions of them all. As we become more conscious of the eyes in us, these little eyes that contradict, that object, that find fault, that criticize, as we become aware of them, we become able to endure them. We become able to, we allow them to sit in the same room together. We can say, yes, those, those, both those eyes are in me. Yup, I'm a basket case, what can I say? And it's where we start. And later we go, yeah, oh yeah, those eyes are in me. You have a problem with that? And then later we say, yes, those eyes are in me and we don't, Say, we don't get belligerent and say, do you have a problem about that? We just say, yes, this, yes, the, yes, the eyes are in me, and a lot of others, too. And we don't have to defend it. We just know that it's so. You see the progression? 
That's all we're talking about. We're talking about progression. Through observing eyes memory, we begin to change this picture of ourselves that we have. Our whole idea of ourself with a capacity for bearing things without being identified. It all begins to change. Our ability to see things inside of us without getting identified and depressed and upset increases. And as that increases, our being changes. You've got to see that what will change you radically. You've got to see if you could just look at yourself dispassionately as if you were an interesting stranger, you would be a different person right now. You've got to see that. This will grow in time. As you practice observing yourself, it will come. It will come. Now, you don't have to trust me. You can verify this yourself. You are different than you were when you started this work. You didn't just wake up different. This is the result of the work that you have done. The, the little bit of observing you have been able to do, the little bit of not identifying, the little bit of separation that you have been able to do has already produced these results. You are already a different person. Your level of being has already changed. You are already better off than you were when you started. You already smile more. You already are lighter about yourself. You already laugh at yourself more. You already can hear things about yourself that you would not listen to before. Isn't that true? Okay. So then, what's the problem? Have fun. Lighten up. Be happy. If you've got a great opinion of yourself, you'll easily be offended, irritated, upset. You'll soon feel negative. As your opinion of yourself starts to take a nosedive, you find that you're not as easily offended. The things that people say and do just are not as offensive to you. You don't have such a wonderful opinion of yourself. You don't feel like you're owed so much. Simple, not easy, but simple. Under the influence of the memory of observing I, we begin to feel loosened from the fantastic ideas and attributions, the virtues, the merits of ourselves that we don't really possess at all, that all exist in imagination. We get these fantastic ideas about who we are. And work memory, the influence of observing I's memory, work memory, starts to loosen us from all that. We start to be freed from all that. We're not tethered by those things anymore. And so we're not bound by those things. And so we're not on the wheel turning with those things. This is a good thing. What's the greatest danger as we get older? Complacency? Well, anything else? Any other ideas? Meaning complacency is not the answer I'm looking for. It's a good answer, but it's not the answer I'm looking for. Becoming more narrow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Becoming more narrow, you agree? No, you got three more narrows and a complacency. Okay, and, you, and you're all right, really, because the greatest danger is to crystallize out into our idea of ourselves. The greatest danger in getting older is that we will crystallize out into our idea of ourselves, that we will actually start to accept and believe our idea of ourselves, that that will become fixed, unchangeable. This is who I am. You know people like this. You have met people like this. They're, they're done. They're closed. Their life is over. It's who they are. That's the way it is. They'll never talk to their children again. They'll never do this. They'll never do that. That's it. This is, this is right. That's wrong. And as long as you do that, you're out of my life. Those people are crystallized out into their idea of themselves. They're done. They are going to have to come back. They're going to, they're, they're going to have to die. The only way for them to, to get out of that is to start over. They're done. Either that or just break them. You can't do that, because then you can't put them back together. So it's, they're done. It's over. Leave them alone. Let the dead bury their dead. That's the greatest danger, to believe our imagination of ourselves, the kind of people we are, how good and kind we are, how generous we are, how virtuous we are, all of our merits, all of our good qualities. To believe that about ourselves, that's the greatest danger as we get older to have that crystallize out so that we are absolutely certain that's the way it is. Uncritical, observing I, if properly supported through your valuation of the work, prevents this early crystallization into a false person because you're not what you've acquired in life. That is not who you are. That's false personality. It's a false person. It's not really you. So it would behoove you not to believe that that is you. But when you get to the point where you believe that that's you and you're crystallized in that, you're done. That's the big danger. We're all such tiny, unpleasant creatures. It takes a great deal of self-observation to see how ridiculous 
our vanity and pride is. And it does. I promise you it does. It takes a tremendous amount of self-observation to see how absolutely absurd we are. Because look at this. We all walk the earth way too proudly. We all think way too much of ourselves. You're nothing, but you don't believe me. I'm nothing, but I don't believe me. Or I've got a bunch of eyes in me that don't believe me. And they come up on the wheel. And one of them takes charge. <laughs> Blustering, blithering idiots. We begin to see this gulf between what we imagine that we are and what we are. It's really quite wide. It's like, oh, but I, I really thought I'd come further along than that. I, all these years and this is it? This is all that? This is all the progress I've made? There's a huge gulf between what we imagine ourselves to be and what we actually are. Thus, our relationship to ourselves begins to change, naturally. As observing eye grows, as work memory grows, your relationship to yourself has got to change. You're going to start to see that you're not who you are. Your relationship with yourself must change at that point. How could it do anything else? Different forms of feeling superior to others begin to be dissolved. Do you have any idea how many different forms of feeling superior to others you have? Well, there's something to observe. We no longer build ourselves up on false personality, which of course is our most dangerous enemy. We don't know that. We act like false personality is, is our savior. Oh, that's who will keep me safe. That's who will protect me from all the wolves in life. Oh, no. That's who will feed you to the wolves after it eats its full fill. Work will not allow anyone to observe themselves further than they can bear. I guess I've said that already. Now, a lot of people can't do it because they can't get under their imagination of themselves. They instantly begin to feel they're no good, of no importance. They begin to suffocate. Okay, that's where they are then. What do you do? Well, nothing. There's nothing to do. You just keep dipping them in the work. It's what I do. This is what I do. I just keep sending a new wave of work ideas your way to wash over you, to dip you in. So if you can't accept it, okay, maybe next week. Well, maybe next year. Maybe five years down the road. What does it matter? I'm going to do this. You're going to do this. You're still here. You're still sitting here. You're still receiving this. Something is washing over you in some way. Something is, you're soaking in this in some way. Eventually, it's going to make a difference because there's something that brings you here. Work calls that magnetic center. Unless a man begins to realize his own nothingness, he can't get anywhere. This is so important. I know I talk about this a lot, but it's because it's very important. We've got to realize our own nothingness in order to get anywhere on this path. We're all trying to study something that is very big, and we've got to realize that we are very small. And when you get that, things get a lot better. You just get a lot lighter. You get a lot happier. You feel a lot less burdened. You feel a lot less depressed. You feel a lot less angry. You feel a lot less cornered. Cornered. You feel a lot less wrong. He's, he's the only one who can do it right. He's always making everybody else wrong. Blah, 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 blah. That's your problem. It's in you. And as you begin to see yourself as less, here's a, here's a sign. If you think someone else thinks they're somebody, you have a problem. I'm sure there are a lot of people in my life who think they're somebody. I don't notice. Why? Why would I? What could it possibly mean to me? This is a one-man show, and you're it. This is, about, this is all about you. You're the center of the universe. It's all about you. Observe yourself uncritically, dispassionately, with humor. Be happy doing it. You received a great gift. This knowledge is a great gift. To be able to apply it and to gain understanding from it, this is a great gift. You are very fortunate. So be grateful and observe yourself happily.